Um, okay, uh, this is a important look at the cardiovascular system. And so whenever I give my talks, I do have uh, some things that I always like to let people know about in advance. That's the acknowledgements for everybody I owe thanks to my uh, co-authors of some of the books that we write and uh, all the other people I work with and my staff and my family. Here's an old one of the uh, boys many years ago uh, when they were very young, they're much bigger now. <laughs> um, and so that's why we all work so hard. Uh, so whenever I give my talks, I am required uh, by the uh, medical bodies, the state bar and everybody to give the uh, full disclosures. So that has to do primarily with the AMA guides. So the AMA guides, um, we have a bunch of books that we've written for the AMA. And so you may have seen these books before. I know you all have one at your nightstand at home, uh, but this is the uh, AMA Guides uh, Foundation book, uh, which talks about the different things that cause different illnesses or injuries. And those of us that are the editors, we do get royalties, um, but trust me, I you know the AMA gets the majority of the money. Um, my co-authors and I figured that we ended up with about uh, less than a dollar a book that we get out of this deal. So I, I'm definitely keeping my day job uh, but uh, but this is the uh, this is the Amy Guides causation book, which is a very important resource for wanting to know what causes different illnesses. This is the Amy Guides workability and return to work book. So this says, you know, what can people do if they have an injury and illness? How do you evaluate them? How do you know that they are or are not able to do certain job functions? Um, this is the guide sixth edition. I know we are a fifth edition state, but uh, mind you, any medical resource can be utilized and just to find an opinion or examine a condition. So that's why the AMA Guide 6th edition can also be used. And I did the internal medicine section. Next, if you have anybody in the office that's relatively new to the world of disability, right? There's short-term disability, long-term disability, social security, all those kinds of systems, right? Then this is a book we put together that, you know, you probably read the whole thing in an hour and a half and not too difficult at all. And it goes over all those different criteria of things to think about. Okay. Now, what are we gonna talk about today? We're really gonna talk about uh, the fifth edition of the books, um, the third chapter and the fourth chapter, right? So the first part of this talk does assume that you have a pretty good working knowledge of the third and fourth chapters. And I'm gonna emphasize certain things within those chapters. And then we're gonna drill down uh, later on into some different aspects of those chapters, right? So here we go, third chapter, right? When you're looking at the third chapter, one of the things I want you to look for in your reports is the subjectives versus the objectives, right? So there's something called the New York Heart Association classification system, right? So what does that mean? So we've always done this, where somebody says, I get chest pain, shortness of breath, limitations. We try to break it down into how significant are those symptoms, right? How much does it really impact somebody? And you're gonna see why the subjectives come into play when we're looking at impairment ratings. Obviously, one of the things that we wanna do is look at the objective measures, right? Because that's really gonna guide the majority of this. And in my world, the internal medicine world, we have some very good objective testing that we can use. Now, probably when you've looked at reports, you've seen all these different kinds of terms before of different ways of going about this, right? Um, and how do you evaluate that? Well, I want you to keep one thing in mind about these different tests. So look at this. Now, now don't let the chart get you to, to bent that shape, just draw your attention to the following thing. If you do a regular stress test, right? Then the sensitivity, how reliable it is, how well it picks things up is about a coin toss, right? That's why on all my testing, I try to do stress echoes, right? Because once you start getting to echoes, right? you start getting a very high rate of reliability, very high rates of sensitivity and specificity. So remember that if you're looking at a report, somebody says, oh, there's nothing wrong with this person, but all they did was a regular stress test and didn't do any imaging with it, then you can see that you're gonna miss some stuff, right? So that's why I'm a big believer in stress echoes. And I'm gonna show you other reasons why I'm a big advocate of stress echoes, okay? now. What do we look for on the stress testing? We look at how well they exercise, what peak they reach to. Do they get their symptoms, right? They say, I got chest pain, but does the stress test bring it out, right? Do they have any regular heartbeat? We look for the electrical change. We look at the blood pressure, but there's one concept here called METS. This is a very important concept. 
So watch this, stay with me on this very carefully, the Met, right? So what is a Met? A Met is a metabolic measure. Now look, uh, this is gets a little bit involved medically, but let me just tell you what it is. It's the amount of huffing and puffing that you gotta do. It's the amount of work, right? So you can imagine that if you get on a treadmill and you start walking and it gets faster and steeper and harder, you're gonna breathe harder. You're gonna pull in more oxygen. You're gonna push out more carbon dioxide. So that's gonna be a higher met. That's gonna be more work, right? Well, why do I care about this stuff? Because if you go to the guys, look, 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 look. Look at how this stuff gets rated, right? So you see here, right on the table, METs, right? So you can see in all these different ways of testing people, the longer you go, the further you go, the more METs you're expending. And look here, those symptoms, right? So what you should see is that if somebody's moving along here, they're getting less and less symptoms, right? Meaning that if you have somebody goes a very short period of time, okay, then their subjectives and objectives are saying some bad news, right? Low METs, low time, uh, very high uh, number on the functional class. Those are the ways that you look at somebody's symptoms and their presentation to know where do they belong in the ratings, right? Okay, for a stress test, you have to log into your 401k. Um, that's another way to do this. All right, so, so, so here we go. So what we're gonna do, is we're gonna walk right through uh, the uh, different sections of the guides. And so we're gonna show how you look at them, right? So here we go, aortic valve, right? So somebody comes to you and they complain of chest pain, shortness of breath, right? You wanna know what's causing that, right? So how do you look at the valves of the heart, the anatomy, by doing an echo? You're not gonna get this by just doing a regular stress test. You're gonna miss it, right? So the cause of their chest pain, shortness of breath limitation may be the aortic valve. What you do is you take that transducer, you put it on somebody's chest, you bounce the sound waves, then you got your aortic valve. And when you look at the sounds, that lets you know how to rate it, right? Same thing, mitral valve, right? Put the uh, transducer on there, put the sound waves on, you're there, right? And that's how you know. You're not gonna get this by a regular stress test, right? You're only gonna get this when you do the echo with it, right? So the echo allows you to look at the anatomy, right? That's one of the big advantages of this, right? Okay, coronary heart disease, right? So this is the circulation of the heart, right? So look at this, look, 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 really helpful for you. Look, look, look. The Department of Labor and others have studied occupations to measure how much work, how much METs are required. And there's been studies about how many METs are needed to perform these activities, right? So look at this, right? You can go to the Department of Labor Statistics and they say, hey, look, this is the number of METs that are required in these different occupations, right? Here's another list, right? So these are the different METs, the amount of huffing or puffing you got to do, right? Well, you could say, okay, look, that's average, but couldn't it be possible that a peak is much higher, right? Isn't it possible that when you just go on a treadmill and you say, okay, run, 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 huff and puff, that somebody says, okay, uncle, I'm done. So that's their peak, right? That's not the average of that job, but you start to get an idea. How can you combine these things, right? And there's been people that have looked at this through the years, right? They said, well, okay, if somebody has a certain amount of METs that they can do, this translates to certain activities, right? And if somebody has certain levels of V.O2 max, which is another measure for the METs, they have certain levels of impairment, right? And for people that played this game many years ago, right? California used to have work preclusions. Then they said, look at their Mets and see what kind of work they can do, right? So as we spoke about, you can't do that for a full eight hour shift. So a lot of people studied that. They said, well, okay, if somebody goes on a treadmill and they get a certain amount of Mets, how much can they do on average for a whole day? And there were all different kinds of guys in that. 
So it turns out that in general, during an eight hour day with breaks, you can get 40% of your maximum net level, right? So look, 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 think about that. So if somebody goes on a treadmill and they get to 10 minutes of work, 10 minutes of puffing and puffing, right? Then you can say, okay, then they can safely do four minutes of work for the day. Well, we know from the Department of Labor that there's all kinds of occupations they can do, right? Well, let's take a look at some certain specific situations which are very applicable for you guys, right? So first of all, if you're less than 15 minutes, once or twice a day, you can go to 80%. And if you wanna go one to three minutes of your maximum net, then you can do that also. Well, firefighters and law enforcement are usually required to hit 12 mets at minimum on the maximum of their treadmill, right? So that's one of the numbers you have to keep in mind. And what's the average duration of an altercation, right? So it turns out that if you look in the literature, the average duration of an altercation is not what you see in the movies. It's about 90 seconds. So now you can say, hey, wait a minute. So I see that if my firefighter or certainly my law enforcement officer can get up to something like 10, 12 mets, then I know that it's safe for them to work, right? But if they're having trouble getting up to that level, then all of a sudden you may be looking at a situation which requires a decision about what they can and cannot safely do, right? And in our book, the Amy Guides um, Worker Building Return to Workbook, I put a chart in there. And I know this looks a little bit busy to you, so just stay with me on it. What I did is I took all those METs and I translated it across into what somebody could do for work lifting demand. What are some sample occupations? What are some home activities? What can they do recreationally? What kind of physical condition they can do? So you can see. You get those METs, you just read it straight across, right? And it helps guide you. What can you do for these people that you need to know about how to evaluate them? Okay, rest stop, all right? So we talked about uh, some of the different introductions to those methods of testing and how to look at them, right? And then we also entered in the discussion of coronary disease. Well, let's take a typical table then, right? So you've probably seen all this before the different classes, the different range of impairments, right? And if you go through, you say, okay, well, what's coronary disease? Well, okay, you got some blockage, right? Some equivocal history. Well, how do you get to class two? Okay, look, 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 you start getting those numbers. Functional class, METs, right? Class three, METs, right? Amount of blockage. Class four, functional class, METs, right? And look, here's the table, right from the AMA guy. So you can see it right there, right? They've got it right here. Functional class one, METs, METs, functional classes, right? So it's on the tables. So now you have that frame of reference, the way to evaluate those things, how to think about those things, about how you're going to address it for people, right? How you're going to know where do they fit in here, right? Look at that range of numbers, right? How are you going to decide where they go, right? Or part of that is on activity day living. That's a whole separate talk I'm not going to give you today, but part of that is looking at that functional class, look at their METs, where do they sit in there, right? Okay, rest up. Now, see this, goodbye cracks. Okay, anyways, um, so next, we're gonna do the other sections, right? So congenital heart disease, right? This is things you're born with, right? And so when I speak to the doctors, this is the stuff I talk to them by, just forget about this. But what I want you to know is, look again, here's the congenital heart disease, look again, functional class. See those things start to slip in there to help guide you, right? Cardiomyopathy goes to the large charts, right? Now in this chart, they don't use the METs, right? But that's wrong. That was written a long time ago. They should have, right? But if you look at other criteria, other past guidelines, they do use METs, right? So for example, Weber has a classification system of using METs, and that's one of the ways that you can go about trying to decide what somebody can do. So somebody to get those dilated hearts, right? Which is something you can see right? Then it's going to be something that you need to know about, okay? All right, this is 2009, 2019, differences in the world we're in. Uh, okay, pericardiology disease. Okay, so here you go. Somebody complains of chest pain, shortness of breath, right? The pericardium is a sac around the heart, right? 
How are you going to know if the reason for the chest pain shortness of breath is due to the valves or it's due to the dilated heart or it's due to a congenital heart or it's due to the pericardial sac around them? How are you going to know? By doing an echo, right? That's the only way you're going to know this thing. That's why you got to do an echo on these people, right? And that's how you're going to be able to get at what is the way to rate these people? What is causing their symptoms, right? You got to know about that echo. Okay, here's the budget echo. All right. Next, uh, irregular <laughs> heartbeats, right? Uh, your health sensor built into the smartwatch prototype isn't working. According to your stupid senses, my heart is going to stop beating in. Okay, it worked. All right. So if you have irregular heartbeats, um, it must be combined with the other things, right? So how do we look at those irregular heartbeats? Well, first of all, same kind of thing on those subjectives, right? And then you're going to be able to document their heart, document their function, and take a look at it, right? And that's going to help guide you on those ratings, right? Uh, it's a pacemaker, plus you're going to download apps for your liver, kidney, lungs, pancreas. Okay, uh, rest up. Here's the boys um, uh, out there. So what we've done is, is we've now gone through chapter three, right? Now I want to take you to chapter four, right? Now this is the home, obviously, of high blood pressure, right? The most common things we see in the law enforcement, probably the most common thing I get asked to comment about in my public safety folks, right? All right, so hypertension heart disease, primary numbers game. I'm sure all the salt water is good for my hypertension, uh, which is good. Please avoid salt for all of you. Don't add salt to your food. That's my little medical thing for you. Um, okay, next. When you classify hypertension, okay, so the fifth edition, use the JNC6 criteria. That's an old criteria, right? So when you see people in their reports, you may see some differences in terminology. They'll talk about something called pre-hypertension, not high normal. They'll talk about just high blood pressure, right? They won't have these different categories, right? But nonetheless, you might see those terms either way, right? So keep that in mind when you're looking at the reports about why you might not see some of that terminology because it's older terminology. The fifth edition was written a number of years ago, right? But when you look at high blood pressure, they're going to be at class one, right? So you see those same ranges of numbers again, zero to 9%. This is the more minimal one, right? Class two. Now you're starting to get some impacts. You may see something on the urine, right? You may see something on the eyes, right? And then you know that you're starting to get in class two. Class three, right? Well, that's the home of left ventricular hypertrophy. You've got kidney insufficiency. You're having a lot of medication to try to control blood pressure. And then class four, this is all the work. This is where you're going to have the medications. You're going to have some uh, heart failure, right? That's what CHF for is heart failure. That's going to push you up in that level, right? So you're going to need to do a careful assessment. Now, how do you know if somebody has left ventricular hypertrophy? How do you know if somebody has a cardiomyopathy? How do you know if they have heart failure? By doing an echo. You've got to get that study done in order to know what's going on with somebody, right? And when you look at this around the world, this is something that's been growing in uh, problems throughout the world. Uh, countries with the highest deaths due to high blood pressure, right? You see right up here, China, India, Russia. This is not just an American problem, right? When you look at the breakdown of different parts of the world, right? You're starting to see more and more uh, deaths coming out from this, right? When you look at ischemic heart disease, right? Uh, when you look at the proportion, right? It's going to be hypertensive heart disease is really driving a lot of the stuff, right? So very important to always know about high blood pressure, to always know that it's called the silent killer, but it is a growing problem across the, across the world. Okay, rest up. Okay, here's three of the boys uh, that they uh, uh, got, obviously got a lot bigger than me. And, um, and so this is Neil Diamond concept. If you don't like Neil Diamond, you're not a human being. Okay, next. Um, uh, disease of the, of the aorta, all right? Uh, so the problem with the aorta, right? The aorta is the main vessel that comes off the top of the heart. Uh, the top of the heart has symptoms. They're going to have chest pain, shortness of breath, wheezing, cough. How do you know if the problem for their symptoms is from the aorta, which comes off the top of the heart? By doing an echo, right? That's why you got to know this, how you do this, right? Next section, right? This is peripheral vascular. This is poor circulation in the arms, right? This is poor circulation in the legs, right? So these are very important findings, right? There's ways of doing this. You can actually do arterial studies of the legs. 
You can measure ratios <coughs> of uh, the blood pressure in the arms and legs, which by the way, by the way, here's one for you, which has a difference in blood pressure, if at all. Is the blood pressure the same in your arms and legs, higher in the arms or higher in the legs? Well, it turns out your blood pressure is higher in your legs, right? So that's ways of doing these measures to take a look at it. Okay, next, the lungs, pulmonary hypertension, right? So this is where you've got high blood pressure in the lungs. Okay, so notice a few things. Look, 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 look. If you have high blood pressure in the lungs, 40 to 50 is already the start of high blood pressure in the lungs. Now we think about our regular circulation, it's 120 over 80. Well, that's because the lungs are a lower pressure system, right? So you get higher pressures at very lower numbers, right? And how do you get an indication that the right side of the heart is working hard to get that blood pressure up in the lungs? By doing an echo. That's where you're gonna get that initial information from. That's why it's helpful because if somebody has chest pain, shortness of breath that's coming from the lung, that would be why you'd wanna know about it, okay? Okay, rest up. All right, so folks, you've survived the overview of the first two chapters, right? And this is very important because it's very important that you know the basics there that we went through. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through a couple of areas that I wanna to talk to you about, right? Things that I think will be very helpful for you when you're analyzing your cases, things I want you to look for in the reports, right? So I wanna to talk to you about risk factors, stress, and some aspects of apportionment, okay? Ready, here we go, right? Risk factors, okay, look at this list. Most people have seen this before, fair, right? Most of you say, oh yeah, I've seen that before. I've heard about that. Those are the common things, right? Fine, right? So risk factors for disease. How about these? Uh-oh, where did this list come from, right? Well, there's lots of information in the literature about risk factors for heart disease. Now let's take a look at some of this stuff, folks, right? So there's some genetic ones, right? Anti-inflammatories can put somebody at risk, right? Do you ever see cases of people that have had musculoskeletal injuries and been put on anti-inflammatories for a period of time, right? Look at this, solvent exposures. What about the firefighters, right? You could see that. Hormone replacement therapy. So for my ladies, uh, one quick little thing. I just wanna go, go through this real quickly for you. A couple of things, one. The original data was in the older PEMPRO. The newer hormone replacement therapy uh, does not place somebody at risk, right? So for my gals that uh, go into menopause, what I'll usually do is if they want, I'll put them on bioidentical hormones, which is low dose seems to be fine. By the way, noise exposure, right? There's some suggestion in the literature that noise exposure causes troubles for you, right? Caffeine. If you are a slow metabolizer of caffeine, right? That you're very highly sensitive to caffeine, that actually can put you at a little bit of risk for heart troubles, right? So for all of you fully leaded drinkers in the morning, I want you to think about that. Next, air pollution, right? Can cause some troubles, right? And so you need to know about that because some people have to deal uh, with patrol. Some people have to be at fires, right? So in those public safety personnel, you're gonna see some of that stuff, right? Um, other risk factors. Um, uh, some people with hepatitis C, HIV, uh, which is the, uh, the old age term, those kind of things, uh, can also put you at a little bit of risk, right? Um, by the way, uh, here's a little study that looked at the risk factors for viral bacterial infections and shows you that, uh, you know, what happens is, is that over time, your cardiovascular risk starts to get a little bit better, but you always have a little bit of risk there laying out for a while, right? And certainly, when you start taking a look, Here's some not so great news, right? This is the average concentration of air pollution in the United States. Look at those sections over there. Look at some of the uh, valley areas, right? Look at this. This is the ozone layer, right? Puts you at a little bit of risk, right? Also, look at this. You know all those folks that are wa walking around with those little air blowers that are blowing your leaves and your grass and all that kind of stuff, bad news. Those are some of the most polluting little uh, engines we've got, right? So you don't wanna be around those things, right? It can put somebody at risk, right? Um, other risk factors, you know, these are some things that you haven't heard about. 
here's some other risk factors. You're going, well, wait, 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 wait. There's, there's so many of these, right? So I'm not saying that you have to know about every single one of these. What I am saying is the following. We know the common things. But if you start seeing somebody that has trouble at age 30, age 40, it has to trigger. Could there be something going on besides just those standard things? Could there be some genetics, right? Is it just bad obesity, right? Because that is very clear that there's an association there. By the way, here's something for you. Obesity by occupation. <laughs> Look at that. The number one group of jobs where people carry too much weight, public safety personnel, right? So this group is at high risk for this stuff, right? And so obesity is going to drive this. Here's another one. Look, look, look. Look at this. This is the average weight during the year, right? Well, look at this. Look what happens here. You start getting to Thanksgiving, right? You get into Christmas and New Year's, right? And what starts happening to all your weight, right? So guess what? Guess what the most common, common time of year for people to get heart attacks, right? Is during the holidays. Now, people will say, well, that's because I have to go home and deal with my family, right? But it's not just going <laughs> home and dealing with your family, right? It's also that you could be overeating, right? By the way, by the way, most common day of the week to have a heart attack is Mondays. The most common time to have a heart attack, usually early mornings, four to eight in the morning, that has to do with some hormonal stuff, but also there's a little bit of that stress equivalent, right? Um, here's other uh, bad news, right? Prevalence of obesity, and prevalence of severe obesity. And look at the trends, 1980, 2000, 2010, right? By the way, these darker colors are not good news, folks, right? So this is all the stuff about the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the heart disease, it's going rampant. And we're not the only ones, right? Look across the world, men, women. By the way, uh, the gals are doing a good job and starting to beat us out in all this stuff. Look at the kids, right? Bad news. You're starting to see high levels of obesity in kids, right? And that's going to be a, a, a major problem going forward, right? And what happens is, as the disability life years, as you keep gaining that weight and the body mass index goes up, here's 1990, here's 2015, right? Here's deaths, 1990, 2015, all going up from this stuff, right? When you look at the cardiovascular risk factors, right? Dietary risks, right? Look at that. Dietary risks beats out tobacco in some of the studies, right? More than the cigarettes, which we already know is a big killer, right? Uh, look at this. Look at this as you see the obesity going up. What happens with the costs, right? Medical costs, disability costs, all from that, right? All right. Another risk, sleep complaints and obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, law enforcement have higher sleep disorders and this is very prevalent. And then the reason that this is important is because what you see is that if you start having sleep apnea, you can have more diabetes, more high blood pressure, more arrhythmias, more hypertensive heart disease, and more uh, uh, coronary artery disease. That's why if I see somebody and they're complaining to me about sleep complaints, you got to know about that, right? So look at your reports. Look at what they're saying to you. If you are seeing people that are saying that they're having some trouble sleeping, check it out, right? That's why I'd like to do sleep monitors on a lot of these folks, right? Okay, here we go. Sad but true. Television 1990, television now, people, right? So that's a big, uh, big difference, right? Okay. Uh, I keep trying to lose weight, but it keeps finding me. Um, one way to lose weight, you only brought two ants to the yard, right? So, okay. Um, and another way to lose weight, well, that would sort of explain why they let three of us on board, right? There's only two because the other ones are on his way out to fishing. Okay. Uh, preventive service task force. 
right? Uh, has a different criteria of looking for risks, right? And so that could be the C-reactive protein, fasting blood sugar. By the way, periodontal disease. If you do not brush your teeth regularly, if you don't floss regularly, it puts you at risk for heart disease, right? Coronary calcium scans can be helpful, some other blood tests, right? Now, I'm gonna be talking next about the most important risk factor you've ever heard about. If you forget everything else I'm trying to teach you today, please remember this, okay? That's chocolate, okay? Chocolate lowers your risk of high blood pressure and heart disease. Probably the polyphenols, cocoa is dark. And wine, and wine, right? <laughs> lowers blood pressure and raises nitric oxide level. It also appears to lower obesity levels because it uh, kind of cuts down some of your craving. So there have been studies that have looked at this. This is one of the most important studies you're ever going to see in your entire career, okay? This is the number of Nobel Prizes versus chocolate consumption. So you can see that as the chocolate consumption goes up, the amount of Nobel Prizes goes up, right? So this is the most important study you're ever going to know. So that's why uh, you should always have chocolate in your diet, right? So I'm a big chocolate person. So you got to be so chocolate oriented in this world. You have chocolate even by bald men is very important. This is the Museum of Chocolate in Havana, Cuba. This is the Museum of Chocolate in Prague. Uh, this is chocolate being the answer. The question is pretty much irre irrelevant. This is the Jewish love affair with chocolate, right? Um, and go ahead, eat your chocolate because it's very good for you. Um, and every chocolate A to Z is important. There's even soaps that are made of like chocolate cake uh, that I highly recommend. This is the cash register in New Mexico. Chocolate comes from cocoa, which comes out of a tree. That makes it a plant. Therefore, chocolate counts as salad. Again, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's one store there that sells chocolate and cashmere. Go figure that out, right? And this is one of my ones for invitation. My doctor is seeing two rows of buttons behind me. Do you have chocolate covered fish oil capsules, right? Okay, so that's the importance of uh, chocolate, All right? Next, I want to talk to you about stress. Okay, so stress is more developed in literature for heart disease and hypertension, but also applies to arrhythmia. Now, I want you to know, there is a poor correlation between patients who complain of irregular heartbeats and having any abnormalities, okay? So you will see people that will say to you, I feel palpitations in my chest. I feel my heart beating funny. And I will test them and not find a thing. And it turns out that's the most common medical result in the literature, right? So when patients say, I feel that stuff, I'm not saying they'll feel it, but when you actually test them, you don't find much. Well, why is that? Well, we all have certain kinds of things that our body sends us signals sometimes, but it really doesn't bear itself out. It's really hard to find it right? And so it's just the way it is, right? Okay. Now, when you look at stress and heart disease, there are some limits in this literature. It can't be retrospective, okay? So you're going to see this a lot. You're going to have people come in and you say, I was stressed my entire career, right? You say, well, but you worked there for 25, 30 years. Why didn't you ever you know, do something about it, right? Well, you know, that's a retrospective report. Sometimes people just say, well, I just suppressed it. Well, I needed the job. I couldn't switch. But, you know, that's part of the, how we sometimes are. Or when, once we get sick, we start looking backwards and, and blaming things in the past, right? A lot of this literature reports on self-report of stress, whereas it's not good objective documentation. People can have already existing depression anxiety that makes them say it's stress, but really it has to be with who they are, right? And mostly males have been studied for the stress literature, not as much women, okay? Women sometimes make fools of men, but most guys are the do-it-yourself type. So don't, uh, don't worry, you don't have to make fools of us. We just do just fine on our own, okay? All right, um, so have there been descriptions of this? Well, yeah, let's take a look at some major things. How about the Northridge earthquake, right? There was an increase in cardiovascular deaths from an average of about 16 day to 51 deaths per day right around the time of the Northridge earthquake, right? There have been changes in the Taiwan earthquake where they showed that the heart rate variability, which is a measure of heart disease, goes up, right? There's been inter-heart studies where they talk about, hey, you can capture almost the majority of all the risk in cardiovascular disease, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, psych but all of a sudden, look, 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 psychosocial factors, right? It's in there, everything we've talked about, right? By the way, if you're a caregiver 
a caregiver for elderly, somebody who's living in your home, and you haven't taken the sick person, that actually puts you at a little bit of risk because of the stress of that, right? Um, uh, silent heart disease has been documented when patients have mental stress, right? Trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, depending on how you define it, does have some increased risk. You're gonna see that in some of the people that were in war zones serving the military services, right? You're gonna see some of those, right? You can see it in a very different population, including in women. We've got one good study in women that increase your odds three, three times as much, right? Combat we talked about, right? And there's also one uh, where they look at uh, in a very large uh, cohort study, 130,000 cases, 170,000 siblings, 1.4 million unexposed, you actually had some increased risk from that stress. Um, now, we did write uh, uh, a paper on post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, acute stress disorder that's in the ACOM guidelines. Uh, and I think we've updated once or twice. So that's a reference that you can also go to if you want to take a look at some of the things that we wrote about, uh, about this uh, particular area, right? Um, depression and risk of heart disease. By the way, this comes from uh, the nurse's heart study. Now, this nurse's heart study is a very good paper and very good study uh, process, which looked at primarily women. And it shows that women who are having troubles uh, with ongoing depression do have increased risk. If you have a friend that's struggling with depression, please know that when you have a discussion with them, it's okay to say, look, you know, I do want to talk to you just about you're feeling bad. I want you to know that there's some literature that says it puts you at some increased risk for trouble in the future, right? All right. There's another one, Takusobo. You may see this one time in your career. I've seen a number of these that have been referred to me. What is that? It's also called broken heart. And what actually happens, there are patients who have such a trauma, such an upset life, such, such a difficulty. They've lost their job. They lost their spouse. They got divorced. Something happened and your heart dilates up. It becomes big. It kind of balloons up. Now, it generally will revert back over time, but it is the kind of thing that shows you the impacts of stress on a person's condition and how it can really impact them, right? Um, what is the mechanism? How does this work? Why does stress cause these kinds of trouble? There's all kinds of literature about this. It could be immunologic, right? It could be from cytokines affecting your blood pressure, so affecting your catecholamines, affecting your hormones. So keep that in mind. There is literature that does support this, right? When we talk about stress, we want to talk about two types, acute and chronic, okay? So generally, you don't get a big argument about acute, right? That's the one where you have somebody gets an upsetting phone call, has to do a life-threatening intervention. So they, and all of a sudden, they grab their chest, they're taken to the hospital, they've had a heart attack. That's very clear, right? Where people start talking about argument is chronic stress, right? We say, okay, well, now they're saying that they've been stressed for a while, right? So first, with any risk factor, it's got to be present, right? Somebody can't just say, well, I felt stressed yesterday, and so now I've got a heart attack, right? In general, these are the kind of stuff that, like any risk factor, has to be around for a while, right? So just for example, you don't smoke one cigarette and have lung cancer the next day, right? You don't have high cholesterol, the next day you have a heart attack. This stuff takes years to form. The same with stress, right? So you want to take a look at that. How long has this person been working, right? So a lot of times when you're doing public safety, folks, you're going to see these people have long careers, right? And so that's going to be something that's going to make chronic stress much more plausible in that group, right? And there's a lot of studies in this area. And I just want to show you oh, just a little bit in this area, just to give you a feeling for how you assess the stress, right? So there's different models that look at this, right? I don't want you to get too blown away by all this stuff, but I do want to show you one little thing. Look at this side. Look, 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 look. When you're talking about stress, you can break it down with decision latitude and psychological demands, right? So what does that mean? That means that if somebody's job allows them to make a lot of decisions, that tends to be less stressful. If somebody's job demands of them to do high psychological work, like 
working fast, working quickly, short time frames, having to really rush, then that's a high psychological demand. So if you have low decision latitude, you don't have much say over your work, and you're under pressure all the time, that's a high strain job. And in those data sets, that shows that somebody's at work, at risk, right? So look at your, you know, waitresses, right? Firemen, by the way, kind of fall into this group, right? Because of that tendency of high uh, psychological demands, low decision latitude, right? Um, there's other scales who have tested high strain jobs. And for example, they saw it in public safety personnel, right? Segrist, he had an effort reward and balance model. Now this is, watch this, watch this, watch this. This is a combination of high job effort, low social reward, okay? High job effort, somebody gives a lot of work, but society says, I don't think that this is a very good job. Is there any profession that any of you could possibly think about that has high job effort and often gets knocked with low social reward, right? Just by chance, do you have any profession that might come to your mind that happens to fit into this model, right? Yep, you guessed it, uh, your lawyers, right? So here you go. That's, that's your little uh, ticket down the uh, cardiovascular stress model, right? And there's ways that you can actually do questionnaires for the stress and know about this, right? The secret of our company's success is that we hire good people, what? You're saying I'm good? I've never heard a compliment at work. What's this feeling inside of me? Is this called self-esteem? Awkward, ignore them, behold my goodness, right? Um, so uh, Karen Belchick, a colleague of mine, she had a, a very good study, by the way, in her risk group, uh, commercial bus drivers are at increased risk, right? Um, there are others uh, that looked at this and they're different ones. By the way, look at this, shift work, okay? Please, please watch that spelling. Shift work has been shown to increase people's risk, right? So when you think about some of the folks that you're tend to see the public safety, that's where that data comes from. That says shift work does lead to cardiovascular trouble. More data, shift work, leading to cardiovascular troubles, right? And so this could be a whole com combination of different models about what could cause somebody to have tr uh, troubles. Um, and there's different ways of looking at this. But we talked about the psychological demands, the so sociological demands, what are your resources? How will you be able to compensate for this? And then when they've looked at this long-term, can you say 60 years of follow-up, right? They show it, right? And that, that tells you that that's where the areas are, right? Okay, the employee schedules all that chemistry. Ammonia bleach is toxic. Carlos and Tony together today. Judah and Romeo get the hose, right? Just let you know what uh, things you always think about who you're working with, right? And when you have a bad work situation, you get cynical about it, that leads to job strain. When you get job strain, it leads you to cynicism and starts feeding on itself, right? So I want you to think about this, right? Is has the strongest impact. Generally, people from lower socioeconomic groups, poor social class, lower education, they start to have hostility, anger, time urgency and patience, they get depressed, they get anxious, right? And they will be the ones that will go down this path, right? Uh, don't underestimate this potential, right? Because say, oh, well, I'm stressed. I'm stressed. It does have an impact, right? There's even ways of doing a stress test, right? You can ask yourself, this, way. this comes from the Wall Street Journal, right? I have control over my time. I receive support and encouragement. My work lends meaning and purpose to my life. Stress can help me learn and grow. I often perform better under stress, right? And you can actually score this out, right? And you score this out and you put your different scorings on there and you can decide, do I have a stressful job, right? Now, let's say you say, okay, I'm under stress. What do you tell patients to do about this, okay? There's all kinds of things that have been shown to help. First of all, number one, I'm doing this every day of my life. You gotta exercise, right? Get outside, very important, right? Uh, hibiscus tea, blueberries, getting a pet can help you lower your stress levels. Volunteering helps you with your stress levels. Get or stay married. Being married helps you. Having a kid helps you. Have at least 14 <laughs> hours before between work shifts. So look, folks, look, 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 look. If you work late one night, so I gotta get this done, and I show up the next morning, if you do that too much and you don't have a good break between your work, right? That's putting you at a little bit of risk, right? So keep that in mind, right? Uh, stay married, 
My wife is starting her own business. I'm sorry to hear that. How many years have you been married? She's not leaving me. She's starting a business. Right. Don't talk about phase two. Got it. Okay. So, uh, Kristen and Kayla, I want to wish you very best on your... Okay. Next. Um, stay married. Back in those couples didn't divorce, famine, disease put them out of their misery. Right? It's a lot easier to admire a man if you haven't washed his underwear. Right? Retirement. Having your husband retire means half the income and twice the husband. Oh, no. Um, men say women should come with an instruction manual. But since when has any man stopped to read the instruction? Okay. Okay. Next. Carrying loss. Husbands go deaf after 20 years. Right? Uh, this is a, a ear doorbell in Milan, Italy, by the way. Uh, what can you do with your husband? Put him in a daycare center uh, where they can uh, go in there. You put him in a restaurant, let him drink, and you can go on and have a very good time. Uh, you can take the uh, stairway to heaven and uh, and take a prayer along with you. Um, and when you exercise, remember to look both ways before crossing the desert, Moses. Um, and uh, that that'll get you some good exercise if you're going through the uh, going through the desert, and that will help you with the uh, help with stress, right? Um, and then when you take a look at this, uh, when you look at physical activity, right? This is a chart of physical activity in the United States. So the blue stuff is good, the red stuff is bad. Right. So if you want to really help yourself, you got to get out there and, and really exercise yourself. I am too blessed to be stressed, too anointed to be disappointed. Right. And then if you're going to take all that, you have to think about apportionment. Right. So what you're going to be thinking about is, is uh, what are those factors that we've gone through today that cause these different things, how to break it up. Right. You can have some apportionment to pre-existing disability. Uh, when I lecture uh, across the country. Right. Uh, sometimes there's some different uh, words and phraseology that you can use for apportionment, but in general, this applies across the board. Um, and causation is that consideration we have to look at. Diabetes, cigarette use, right? And decide, is this natural progression or is there an onset right at, right at the time of it, right? And you have to balance those things about what is the counter argument to apportionment, right? What is that going to be? Is it that they had a sudden onset of that acute stress those risk factors were not operating, or did they have those risk factors for a year? That's how you break it up, right? And so when I talk to the doctors, I always say, look, this is your medical opinion. You have to give your best opinion based on reasonable probability. If you keep doing this properly, you're sure to anger a lawyer, which is your real job and joy in life, uh, and that's the voice. Okay, so um, here we go. I'm going to come off of this thing uh, and uh, let you uh, have a chance to, uh,